Are traditional expert calls in the investment world becoming obsolete? According to Stream, they are. And you can access primary research easily and efficiently through their platform. With Stream, you'll have the right insights at your fingertips to make the best investment decisions. They offer a vast library of over 26,000 expert transcripts powered by AI search technology. Plus, they provide competitive rates on expert call services, and you can even have an experienced buy-side analyst conduct the calls for you. But that's not all. Stream also provides the ability to engage with experts one-on-one -on -one and get your calls transcribed free of charge, all for 40% less than you would pay for 20 calls in a traditional expert network model. So if you're looking to optimize your research process and increase ROI on investment research spend, Stream has the solution for you. Head over to their website at streamrg.com to learn more. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. All right. Hello, and welcome to yet another value podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker. If you like this podcast, I mean a lot if you could rate, subscribe, review, wherever you're watching or listening to it. With me today, I'm happy to have on for the second time, my friend, Chad Garcia. Chad is the portfolio manager at the, I'm doing this for memory. It's the Ave Maria uh, Focus Fund, right? Ave Maria Focus Fund. Ticker there we go. AVEAX. <laughs> Say it again, just so people can hear it. Ticker AVEAX. And Chad, he is, the, they have won uh, the Category King Award four times this year. And we were talking before and he said, well, you know, if they award him every month, it would actually be more. But congrats on a good year so far. I, I won't dive too much in, more into it for compliance reasons. But speaking of compliance, let's start with the disclosure. Nothing on this podcast is investing advice. That's always true. Today, we're going to be talking about an international stock and international stocks carry extra risks, extra considerations. So everybody should keep that in mind as we talk through the stock. But Chad, I, I, I'll turn it over to you in one second. I just want to say, I I was so, I, I looked at this company a few times before, but I really dove into it yesterday. And you and I have some mutual contacts in common who will probably attest to, I was just calling everyone like, I'm so interested in this. I need to talk. I need to understand this board. So I'm really interested in that this idea that's going to come off through the podcast, but let's dive into it. The company is eDreams and I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Yeah, eDreams, Dojo. I started looking at this in 2019, and I had the same feeling that, that you have now when I when I looked at it. I'm like, what is this small European online travel agency that I never heard of that has an American CEO and seems to be doing everything right? So, the company was was formed in the in the 1990s, like several other online travel agencies. It was put together through a combination of several acquisitions. Um, it went public in 2014. It stumbled a little bit when Google adjusted their algorithms on their on their search engine optimization, and then that caused a change in management where Dana Dunn, an American, took over. And since then, it seems like they sidelined Google's as as um, and eliminated kind of the Google problem that that's plagued other online travel agencies, particularly Ex Expedia and. They launched a subscription program that they called Prime um, after you know, Amazon's Prime. It's more, in my mind, though, akin to Costco's program, but I don't think Costco doesn't have a, a sexy name for their subscription program. They just it's called the Costco membership. But you know, and since then, the, the business has done well. I invested in it uh, in 2019. COVID hit. It was a it was a painful time to to own it through COVID, um, but the Aubrey Maria Focus Fund we launched in in May of 2020, so right after COVID hit. It's a nice time to launch a fund. No, 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 no. March would have been a nice time to launch a fund. <laughs> By May, this, the world still looked like it was falling apart, and everything was priced up because of the Fed's liquidity. So it was a little challenge. It's a little more challenging than you would think. But that said. Uh, the company, which has its fiscal year end and on, Mar on March 31st, uh, printed their, their Q4 in, in uh, late May, early June of, of 2020. And they had some months of COVID, COVID's impact in it. And you could see that the company would have several years ahead of them, um, even with significantly curtailed travel. And, and at that point, I, I invested in it, you know, in the Ave Marie Focus Fund, you know, kind of shortly after the, the Q4 print. And that, you know, it's been a good decision for us. Great. So let's fast forward a little bit to today, right? The the key thing with, and I would encourage anyone to go read their investor deck because I, I think it lays out a lot of this nicely. You mentioned the Costco membership. They start talking about Prime Costco. But I guess the key thing at this point is 
they've kind of got proof of concept with Prime, right? They're up to 4.7 million Prime members. It sounds silly calling it Prime. I just think Amazon when I say it, but they're up to 4.7 million Prime members. They're talking about, hey, the Prime, you know, it's got all the things, subscription-based, better margins, all this type of stuff. So why don't you just quickly cover what the Prime offering is, what it gets you when you sign up for it? And then, right. you know, most of my questions actually relate to Prime because that's really the key question point on the story currently. So let's back up real quick. Yep. eDreams is a global online travel agency, but about 80% of their business is in, in Europe. And they're focused on leisure travel. So they're not really exposed to business travel or you know, traveling consultants. They're exposed to leisure, which rebounded a bunch quicker after COVID than, than uh, travel in general. And what they've done is they develop a prime program. You spend 55 euros on it a year if you're if you're European. And it gives you discounts and travel. And so if you look at the legacy of, of eDreams, they started out focusing on flights. And so for an American, it, I think it's a little hard to at first kind of get your arms around it because yep. online travel agencies for flights in, in the U.S. is a horrible business. And the reason why it's a horrible business is that you've got the top four airlines in the U.S. control about 75% of the routes. And they have fantastic apps that you can use, that you can book your tickets on, you can make changes, et cetera. In Europe, the top four airlines control 29% of the routes. So you have much more fragmentation. 80% of the flights in Europe are multinational flights. They're often multi-legged. And, and uh, their customer service isn't as, as great as it is in the U.S., even though you know, people complain about U.S. customer service. It's very rare in Europe to find a 24 seven customer service phone number. Their apps aren't up to the level that the US apps are. And you know there are over 690 airlines that operate within Europe. So it's, it's highly fragmented. Uh, the, um, the airlines pay online travel agencies a, a fee for booking customers you know via their airlines and online travel agencies often charge their customers a booking fee so there's you know two revenue streams traditionally for an online travel agency in Europe um eDreams charges their prime members 55 euros membership fee and then for that they give back both the the airline fee and the customer direct booking fee and so the customers can generate substantial savings from it, and and eDreams is only looking to make the fifty five euros off of the, off their customer. And so, if they just book an, uh, a flight, then it pays back with typically within two bookings. And by the way, eDreams also extends the prime pricing for anybody uh, who who you book that's traveling with you. And so, you know, if you book a family of four, it essentially pay for itself. On, on the first booking. And, and when you say pay for itself, just to clarify for listeners, the Prime membership pays for itself, right? I subscribed right. for a 55 or 80 euro per year Prime deal. I get 50 euros off my first flight. My second flight, I get 50 euros. Boom, I've saved 100 euros I've paid for for the Prime deal. And and there there shouldn't be too many, um, there shouldn't be too many opportunities for an airline to be able to price cheaper than an online travel agency in Europe because of the fragmentation uh, for you know, a couple of reasons. Number one is that there is a history of, of booking with online travel agencies and airlines pay for that, pay them for to do that, uh, number one. But even more importantly is that because of the fragmentation, there, there's more opportunities to do what in the U.S. they would call hacker tickets. So you fly outbound on, on one airline and fly inbound on a, on a different airline. You put the two tickets together and they're, and they're much cheaper, um, particularly if you have an app such as eDreams app, which will help you, you know, manage your flights. Perfect. So, e, so eDreams, eDreams, online air travel agency should be the price, the, the, the lowest, the lowest price um, way to book in, in Europe. And then, if you're a Prime program member, you even get a, a lower price. Perfect. So let's. I, I'm going to dive into the Prime. Uh, we'll dive into the Prime membership in a second. But let's just start with 
the the overall vision because I think that's what's really exciting and like again the Q1 results were really good the Q4 results were really good like you're starting to see kind of the proof in the pudding and they're kind of starting to hit the flywheel is the hope right but let's just start the overall vision they've laid out I believe it's 2,025 targets and can you just talk to me about what those 2,025 targets are and what they would kind of imply for the stock so people can get an idea of you know why it's exciting why the bull case why I was so excited yesterday what the bull case is well they laid out the 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 vision in November of 2021. And it was to have 180 million plus of EBITDA and 7.25 million prime members. Um, coming out of COVID, when, when the lockdowns were released in June of 21, they had about a million prime members. And today they have probably Five million prime members. Yep. So they've grown you know, four million prime members in in uh, two two and a quarter years. Um, they're still growing about three hundred and seventy five thousand prime members every quarter, which is on pace to hit that seven point two five million prime members by the end of fiscal year twenty five, which is March of twenty four. And now a quick word from our sponsor. Are traditional expert calls in the investment world becoming obsolete? According to Stream, they are. And you can access primary research easily and efficiently through their platform. With Stream, you'll have the right insights at your fingertips to make the best investment decisions. They offer a vast library of over 26,000 expert transcripts powered by AI search technology. Plus, they provide competitive rates on expert call services, and you can even have an experienced buy-side analyst conduct the calls for you. But that's not all. Stream also provides the ability to engage with experts one-on-one and get your calls transcribed free of charge, all for 40% less than you would pay for 20 calls in a traditional expert network model. So if you're looking to optimize your research process and increase ROI on investment research spend, Stream has the solution for you. Head over to their website at streamrg.com to learn more. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Can you talk to me? So on page 25. Year on pace, they hit the 7.25 million members, the 180 million cash EBITDA. Can you talk to me? And again, this would be most of the cash EBITDA prime is a subscription membership. We'll, we'll right. talk more about the prime and the implications. But, you know, subscription, 180 million subscriptions probably going to carry a higher multiple than 180 million in EBITDA from one time booking fees and stuff. But 100 million cash, 180 million cash EBITDA, if they hit that, can you kind of put that into perspective versus the current stock price? Well, they're... Last year, they delivered 84 million of EBITDA. They'll probably hit 125 to 130 million of EBITDA this year. If they hit the subsequent year 180 plus, you know, then then you're looking at EBITDA growth of north of 40 percent. And so, you know, if you have a revenue and earnings stream that's predominantly driven by subscription, makes it very stable. What would you value? a such an earnings stream at you know if that earnings stream is going at 40 percent plus you know i would i would say it, it'd be in the low single digit free cash flow yields and so if you're looking at a one and a half to three and a half percent free cash flow yield that probably gets you to 20 to 30 euros stock price so, i think yeah. that's and i think that's worth it's worth that today 20 to 30 euros and it's trading at 650. And just to put it for people, you know, one and a half to three and a half percent cash yield, if I'm doing the math in my head right, that's about a 33 to approaching 50 times uh, free cash flow multiple if you want to use a multiple instead of cash flow yield. So as you said, it's trading between six and seven euros. You think it's worth about 20 euros today and it could be greater as Prime kind of continues to grow. I mean, there's great stats in here. Hey, they've only launched Prime. I think it's in four of the 11 countries that they cover. And obviously they've got more, they've got flights to over 44, I think. Am I kind of thinking about those that math in my head correctly? They've launched Prime in, in more countries, but it's not, I mean, they they have Prime going in the US right now, but it's not yeah. a fully functional Prime. So f- fully functional Prime is just kind of the core, the core European markets at, at this point. Um, and so if you want to talk about the growth beyond fiscal year 25, I mean, one is just deeper penetration in the, in the current European markets uh, with Prime. And right now in their core markets, Prime is about three percent penetrated in in their core markets for travelers who would you know, use online travel agencies. Um, in their 
highest penetrated market, which is France, it's four and a half percent penetration rate. And you know, this this product saves customers money. And so that's that's uh it's a pretty good value proposition if you're a traveler in Europe to use. And so I would I would imagine that they would they're gonna have much more success growing the prime offering within Europe just on flights. Now, you know, they, they will sell you hotels and they have have um, sold hotels for several years. They haven't really made a large push into it. And that's what's, you know, really exciting to drive growth beyond their, their fiscal year 25 targets. So, and you know, the reason why it's, it's taken a little bit of time is that their website was predominantly kind of flight focused. And it's not to the level yet that they really want to do a hard push into the hotels. I mean, they'll sell you one. And I've, I did some travel this summer and I've used it and it was, I thought it was fantastic. And I thought their offering was good, but you know, they want to be able to, if you want to search for a hotel, let's say you're traveling to Paris and you like Sofitel Grand Hotels, you, you can, you know, right now you can put in there and, and have a map show, show you all the hotel offerings that they have um, in Paris, but they want to be able to, to further parse that down. So, you know, show me all the Sofitel hotels in Paris and put it up on a map for me. Functionalities like that. Um, furthermore, the discount that you get for being a Prime member, you have to, on hotels right now, you have to kind of put a code in and so you, you get it at the end. You don't really see it um, up front on the on the search screen. And so they want to kind of figure a way around that. So customers really uh, give eDreams the credit for delivering the savings that it, that it does. Um, but this is coming, I would suspect, by the end of this calendar year or early next calendar year. And I think that the Prime program will give them a structural superior product in which to go after bookings.com, which right now has a, a you know basically a monopoly in hotel bookings in Europe. So I think there are so look, I think you framed the bull case great. And as you said, just getting into hotels, expansion, like it, it, two, they've got the 2025 targets, which the stock would be a multi-bagger on the 2025 targets. But what's so exciting is if they hit those 2025 targets, like it's kind of just the beginning, right? They'll just be ramping up into hotels, that more markets, everything. So you've got tons of upside here. Let me They're turn- coming to the US. They're coming to the US. They've hired a, a airline relationship manager in the US um, last winter, springtime, you'll see that happening, but, but that's not going to, you're not going to see that until after they launch hotels. That's, that's the big, the big market they need to go after next. Let me turn to I, my computer's running a little slow. I hope it's not affecting the video, but neither here nor there. Let, let me turn to the question, right? This was asked a little bit on the Q1 call, but the big mm -hmm. questions in my mind, there, there's two like kind of branching questions here. And it's, Hey, these guys are launching a membership model. There are a lot of travel, but OTA travel business out there. To my knowledge, except for one, none of them have tried a membership model right like this, right? And the one exception is TripAdvisor, which we'll talk about separately. Let, let's start with TripAdvisor, actually, because that that is like people who've listened to this podcast, people who've been in the value investing community will know TripAdvisor tried to do something like this. And some of the stuff you were saying sounds very reminiscent of TripAdvisor, right? Like with the hotels, TripAdvisor said, hey, join us $50 a year. We'll give you a discount on the hotel. But there was, uh, I, I think it was price parity deals with hotels. They couldn't show you the discount up front. You had to be a member and get all the way to the end for them to show you the discount because of price parity deals. And you know the TripAdvisor thing, it sucked a lot of investors in, my, myself right. included, where they had this huge funnel uh, they, they argued we create all this value. They had this huge funnel, a differentiated thing. They tried to launch the membership model and for a bunch of different reasons, it failed. So I guess the first thing in my mind is, hey, Chad, why isn't this trip advisor all over again? Well, I would say that if you have a moat, the evidence of that is the corpses of your competitors. And then, and this is one of them. I mean, starting a subscription program in travel is not easy. You know, eDreams, has done it, and it, but it took them a long time to do it. Um, it's still in their early days, but they already have success. Um, probably took them beginning in, in flights in order for them to do it. In Europe, it's legal for a travel agency to price a flight cheaper than that of an airline. And you know, when you have the, the two levels of booking fees traditionally that that you can give back, I mean, the the economics. There are you know, 
are easy to see you know, for, for a traveler. Like, okay, I, I would play 500 euros for a flight, but if I'm a prime member, maybe I pay 450 because they're not making the booking fee. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty easy to see. Um, and then if you look at booking or TripAdvisor, I mean, they can't sell a Marriott hotel room cheaper than Marriott because of the, because of the agreements with the hoteliers, the price parity agreement. But if you book through eDreams and you book a flight and then you tack a hotel room onto your trip, you kind of, you've created a, a dynamic package or kind of a, a, a walled garden. And within that wall, eDreams is free to give the, to give a discount back to their customers. And like from the hotelier's perspective, who knows where that came from? Did it come from the flights? Did it come from the hotels? Like where did it come from? So in a in a closed environment, you can you're you're free to to do more of, of that, which booking can't do right now. Um, you know, unless they really push into dynamic packages, and TripAdvisor couldn't do when so, they tried to launch the program. So a lot of it in your mind is just because it, this actually goes nicely into the booking because the the second question is, hey. Booking, Expedia, I, I think there's a Desperagar is the Latam one, a few others. Like most of the, almost all of the other OTAs have some type of loyalty or rewards program. And they all kind of look alike. Like they're all, to my to my knowledge at least, not that great. You kind of get like 1% of your cash. Back. You, you kind of get mm. credits. Like I, I book all of my stuff through Expedia, which is probably a mistake on my end. And I, after all the travel I've done over the past five years, I think I've got like 60 bucks in credits from them or something. But all of them right. have a similar structure. Like why was eDreams the right one to crack, to crack getting a membership model? Because I, I would have thought booking, right? Booking is the world's largest is the world's largest travel company they yes they've got some trouble with marriott hotels and stuff but in europe it's a lot of independent hotels hotels are a lot higher margin than flights i would have thought they were the best position to kind of launch a membership model well they have the price parity agreements with the hoteliers to deal with and so it's, they can't price cheaper than the hoteliers um and then they're also competing with hotel hoteliers their own loyalty programs i mean i've, I've used Expedia and basically you get 10% of your, you know, every, every, uh, every 10 nights you stay, you get the average of the 10 previous nights back to spend on, you know, on, on their site. That's how their program works. Um, but you know, over time I just gravitated it, it, with a lot of my travel being in the U S I just gravitated towards the Marriott program, the Marriott credit card and that yep. you know, worked much better for me. Um, so I, I think, you know, why did it, eDreams get it right. I think they got it right because at first they were in flights, and and flights you could price cheaper than than uh, than airlines, and and so it, it made sense for them to to do that and kind of launch the Prime program off of off of airlines. And now that will have benefits into hotels because again it will create this kind of walled garden where they could they can give the discount backs for both booking fees, the hotel booking fee, as well as the airline booking fee, and in the eyes of the hoteliers then you know it won't it won't really matter to them because you know it doesn't it's not going to appear like they are undercutting marriott from a price parity pr let perspective me ask, let me ask another question so you know they've got the netflix and costco comparison right i, right. I guess i just want to dive really into the costco comparison here with eDreams, what what their argument would be is hey we get the prime membership we're going to give you the flights at cost Pretty much like Costco is giving you close to at cost and then we'll make all our money from the prime membership. I guess my my questions there is, you know, what's the marginal cost of them giving a flight? Because it does strike me if I think they get like three to five percent commission for selling a flight that actually might be a little high. If they're kind of giving that all back to you, like what's the marginal cost? Could they start losing money on prime members who are, you know, traveling once a month or something? Well, I mean, from that, from the framing of that question, they would. I mean, so you're saying that they if they they do twelve bookings a year? Yeah, I, I guess what I'm just wondering is, you know, if I'm Expedia and I'm t or someone else, a competitor, and I've got a person who's booking a flight a month with me, and I'm getting like right. three percent commissions, that's going to add up to I, I don't know three hundred sixty dollars in gross profit over the year. And I guess what uh, I I guess what eDreams is saying is, hey. You just pay us the $80 per year membership and we'll give you that gross margin back, right? Which is a great deal, win-win right. all around. 
I'm just wondering, is there marginal cost yeah. here that's really eating into it where the more someone does, you could get really underwater on a prime membership? No, no I don't think so. I mean, it, you, you would, um, well, n- number one, they've got the IT, uh, AI driven IT actually. There you go. Would, an AI player. Yeah, Let's go. That would, uh, that would allow them to kind of pull le- levers to kind of prevent that from happening. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that the overhead cost of the business is going to be going up because some of the you know, books 12 times a year as opposed to two times a year. Okay. I mean, it's all, it's all, it's all IT and, you know, backend overhead that they're going to be u- utilizing. It's the margin, you know, it's the, it's the marginal cost that they're, you know, the variable cost component that they're kind of taking down to near zero. Yeah, now that I think about it, that's silly. Let, let me go to a different one, right? I think they've only disclosed churn once. And somebody asked them about churn on their last call and they said, we don't disclose it. We only disclose it once so you guys can see how it's going. But I, right. I think they said churn is going well. And my worry is, you know, with TripAdvisor had this, right? You would get to the end and they'd say, hey, your hotel is going to cost you $500, but sign up for TripAdvisor Plus for $50 per year and we'll save you $50 on this hotel or maybe even $75. So why not sign up? And people would sign up and then guess what they would do? They would cancel before they got hit with the second charge. And I do wonder, I think people probably fly, especially in Europe, fly a little bit more. But could you have a churn issue where, yeah, you've got tons of people signing up because it saves them money on the first trip. But then you're kind of having an exploding problem where everybody's canceling after a year and they've kind of already got the savings. I mean, you you would see this. Well, this this is going to save people money on multiple trips. And Europeans like to travel when they take... You know, more than one trip a year. And so the incentive is to keep keep the prime program. Um, and it gets charged up front. And so it's not like they're going to give you the savings away on the first one and not be able to recover it because you know they charge it up front. The churn, true churn, I would suspect is high single digits, low double digits for true churn. That, that means somebody doesn't like the program, affirmatively wants to quit. I would say that the churn looks to be much higher and maybe, you know, mid twenties, maybe percent. And as I think, if I, if I remember back from the one time they disclosed it, because in Europe, it is illegal for a company to reach out to their client if the client's credit card expired. So oh, if the credit card expires and they say, hey, you know, usually you get an email in the US, hey, your credit card expired, please update it. You can't do that in Europe. And so those, those figures are in their churn numbers, but then when the client goes and books their next trip, they find out that their credit card expired, they update it and they and they resubscribe. And so that's not, in my mind, that's not true churn, it's just more delayed revenue. That is one of the silliest rules I, I've ever heard. I, it, it seems so consumer unfriendly, it's ridiculous. A lot of my questions have come, right. I, I, I'm US domestic focus, right? A lot of my questions have come, and I think I've got a U.S. point of mind. And I say this because you mentioned, hey, Europe, they like to travel more. They're famous for their long summers, uh, hopping through cities and stuff. Do you think a lot of investors who are U.S. focused are having trouble with eDreams because they see, hey, U.S., 80 to 85 percent of the flight markets dominated by Delta, Southwest, United, American hotels? You know, it's Marriott, Hilton, uh, one other one. You know, it's really dominated by the brands, whereas if you go to Europe, as you mentioned, Flights are really fragmented. Hotels are crazy fragmented in Europe. Yes, they do have Marriott and stuff, but most people who go are going to stay at a local hotel. They've got tons of local boutique hotels and stuff. Just much more fragmented, much more room for an OTA to kind of take share, much more room for flights to compete with the OTAs by offering cheaper flights or offering bigger commissions to kind of put their flights at the front of the line. Do you think that U.S. framing is hurting investors from understanding what's happening here? I think that could be a barrier to entry for for some for some people. I mean, I, I it took me several months to get around to looking at it when uh, my friend, who's a large investor, you know, told me about it, and I I kind of looked at it from a, from an American perspective. And then after a few months of him bugging me, I finally looked at it and realized there was something there. But that said, if you look at the shareholder base, you know, the the most some of the most astute investors in the shareholder base are American funds. So you know, there are Americans who who definitely get it. Another question, a lot of people, and this kind of relates to the churn question I asked earlier, but a lot of people, when I said, hey, Chad's coming on eDreams, what do you think? Both on the replies and in kind of DMs and stuff said, hey, 
it seems like they're always moving the ball on us and not in terms of their long-term guidance, but the disclosures here are constantly evolving and changing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think they're kind of trying to pull the wool over everyone's eyes by changing the disclosures constantly so that nobody can kind of track them. What would you say to that criticism? And how did you get comfortable with kind of the changing disclosures and natures of what they're giving you? I mean, I don't think the disclosures have changed, you know, all too much. The one disclosure, the one major change that they had um, happened last quarter where they stopped disclosing bookings for prime members. And because if you look at, I mean, this company is, is terribly covered by the sell side. And one of the things that the sell side that do cover it is focused on is on the booking numbers and the booking numbers aren't, aren't relevant to the economics of the company because over 50% of the revenue is now coming from prime over 55% of the profit is now coming from prime. And, you know, as that continues to evolve, you know, the economics are driven by prime absolute membership members, the the rate of prime growth and, and prime churn is not driven by bookings. And so they did make that one change, but it doesn't really bother me that much. Doesn't bookings matter just because it shows how frequently the prime members are using this and thus uh, it's an indication of how much value the prime members are getting? Like if I showed bookings was going well, way down, either A, people are not traveling as much, which is bad for prime, or B, people are booking off prime using a different thing. They're traveling as much. I'm just losing share, which is a disaster because one of the things with the membership model is you want to basically take 100% of your customer spend once you get the right. membership model and can offer them a bigger discount. Well... I would say that if there's any issues with the current prime membership, you would see that in the margins and the okay. margins are, and the margins are going up. You would see that in the margins for, because they would have more churn and if, if they have more churn and they have to spend more to keep them to acquire new kind of prime members to keep the net prime membership growth up, you'd, you'd see that in the margin. Cause I would assume, I assume uh, in, in my modeling of it that they give back or they give to google a good portion of the first year's prime fee and so they really start to make the money on prime members after year one about 75 percent of prime members come to eDreams directly so they don't go to google or other meta search providers to 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 get there, um, that's what drives the profitability of the of the prime program, kind of yep. like that number and, and like the anniversary members. And so, if there's problems with it, you're going to see it in the margins. And right now, the margins are going up. So, and, and as you said, like that's another great thing about the prime. Once you subscribe to some, once you subscribe to something, and they say, "Hey, we're going to give you the cheapest things, cheaper than you can find anywhere else." Your customers not only just don't have the incentive to go to Google, they'll often start booking. They just open your app and book directly through you, which saves you all the Google marketing and everything fee. So it's great for your overall business. Well, booking was at Goldman's conference yesterday presenting. eDreams is out there meeting investors today. They're not presenting, but, they're, but they've been invited to Goldman's conference, which is going to be fantastic exposure for them. But setting that aside, they booking talked about 48% of their of their um, customers book on their app and about 50% book directly with them as opposed to going through Google. If you look at eDreams, about 58% of their customers book on app, which leaves 62% desktop either going directly to their website or through Google. They don't disclose that, but you know they do have a much higher, um, at least on the app, side of things, people booking, you know, directly with them as opposed to going through Google than, than even, you know, the 800 pound gorilla price line does. And I think that, you know, as they do a bigger push into hotels, you know, they're already into ground transportation, they're into rental cars. When they do a big push to hotels, you know, they, they could ultimately be like the one-stop shop for European travel. Let's, as they push into hotels, obviously they get more into more. We we talked earlier about how they were, you know, flights, which probably five or seven years ago were a much lower value business. Even today, it would be a much lower value business because it's more competitive. You get lower fees versus hotels. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
they were advantage versus booking because that enabled them, that gave them a better launching point for the membership model. As right. their membership grows and as they push more into hotels, like eventually you have to see a competitive response from booking, I would imagine. So how do you think this plays out as we start to see a competitive response? Like, do you mm -hmm. think booking, if they, once they see 7 million members here and 180 million EBITDA, do you think we see a booking membership rollout? Do you see like kind of a, a battle in the streets for members going that way? Well, you know, bookings in their arena, they're, they're trying things. So the question is <laughs> bookings, the man in the arena, <laughs> E-Dreams is the man in the arena. We're all in the arena. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the question is, is that like, will it be successful in, in launching a subscription program? Will they be successful in flights? How long will it take? And like, will they ultimately care? Yeah. So if you look at, I mean, just go back to Booking's talk yesterday at the, at the Goldman conference. They are trying what they call connected travel, which is dynamic packages, like having you know more than one product. Um, they say that flights are important to them. So the way that they are getting into flights, and flights isn't easy, by the way. So think about this. You've got over 690 airlines in Europe. And each of them have their own IT systems. And so just to build the APIs to deal with 690 different companies' IT systems is challenging. And then once you build the APIs to talk to them, you've got different fare rules and fare policies that you have to be able to take from a, from an airline and translate onto your website. And so it's it's not easy from a from an IT perspective to get like flights right. And booking doesn't have you know that capability in-house yet. What they've done is they've went to the number three player in European flights, eTraveli, and they've had an agreement with them that they've extended through 2028 to have eTraveli kind of white label a flights product for for booking. And then um, they ultimately wanted to bring it in house, and they tried to to buy them. And right now, it's held up by the European regulators. I don't think it's going to go through. And so, they, you know, if they are successful in flights, it's going to take a long time. Um, it will, and, and if they are successful, you know, they'll have an outside entity basically have them over having them over a barrel on on um, on the program, you know, like. Yeah, maybe they have, maybe they each have each other over the barrel, but um, that, that's what I mutually assured, assured destruction in some way. Yeah, yeah, but then right, but you have a, you have like another organization that's getting economics on it on, on you, right? Um, their their whole business model right now is built on hotels where they basically have a, a almost a monopoly, and so you know, in addition to the challenges of, of building a flights program. You know, they also have the challenge of building a subscription program, which which you know takes some, takes some time, and it's it's a different model than they've built their business on. And so, you know, I look at it and see a situation that's that's similar to to Heiko, the uh, the aircraft parts manufacturer. You know, like or, there's a, a Harvard Business School professor David Yaffe who had a, a book called Judo Strategy, where he used the competitors' size against them if you're a smaller player. And you know, in the case of Heiko, they make replacement parts for commercial airlines and uh, commercial aircraft, they, they price about a 30% discount to the original equipment manufacturers and they capture about a 30% of the market. And the OEMs are not going to get into a price war with them because they'll just rather, you know, see 30% of the market as opposed to crushing the margins on the 70% of the market that they retain. And so it seems like this situation is, is very similar. I mean, eDreams doesn't have to kill booking, but Imagine how big they would be if they got 5% of their European hotel volume. You know? On the hotels, uh, two or three people when I was talking to them about eDream said they were a little skeptical of the hotel initiative. And they basically said, look, hotels in Europe, again, I'm American focused. It's easy to think, oh, you just get a deal with Marriott and Hilton and you've covered 85% of the rooms you need. They said hotels in Europe, you really need to go like door to door, knocking out, getting connected to, you know, individual hoteliers, uh, uh, insides getting them on your website and that that takes a lot of it takes a lot of sales and marketing they said look if you look at eDreams most of their hotel api not all but most of their inventory seems to be coming from they're just buying the booking api do you think 
Is that right? Do you, or do you think it doesn't matter because maybe that's the case right now, but you know, in five years, they'll have more members and they keep building this out, building this out, building this out. Eventually, they'll get the inventory on their own. Well, let me ask you, if you're a hotelier in Europe, what do you think of booking? Who has a you know, I, I'd, pro I'd probably want to, I'd probably, it's the same if you have an online business. You'd probably like a competitor to Google just to bring the margins down and have different places to point people. Well, I think there's your marketing right there, your sales and marketing right there for eDreams. And then, and then furthermore, I would imagine that the eDreams Prime member is probably a higher value customer for a hotelier than your average booking customer, which may be a little bit more flighty and might cancel a little bit more often than, than somebody who's going to go out of their way and spend 55 euros to be in a membership program in order to travel. Yeah, you know, that that might be true. It, it does strike me like hotels seems to me is the way you really unlock this prime membership. Because again, I think you get roughly 3% fees on flights mm -hmm. and you probably get five to 10%, maybe more on hotels if you're like boosting someone to the top of the page. But also hotels are going to be a much larger purchase in general, just because you book three nights at 300 versus one trip at 300 or something. So right. it does seem to me like as they unlock the hotel inventory, that's where the prime membership really starts unlocking because that's where they have a lot more margin that they can give back to the consumer or that they really can start proof pointing the value of this membership up. I might be, I mean, I'm not an expert. I might be imagining that, but that seems like a really interesting unlock. And again, they, well, they, they built, just they started built, and they're still growing. They built, a five, they built a 5 million member program on the back exactly. of flights. <laughs> exactly. So. But, but it, it just seems like, you know, the, they, one of the things that got me so interested is Q4 and Q1. Like it, it, a year ago, I would have been really skeptical, right? I would have been saying, Chad, we saw this with TripAdvisor. Nobody does that. Now it's just, hey, the proof is in the pudding. Like we're, we're seeing the memberships accelerate. You're seeing it starts to be profitable. Just seems to me like as I start, as in 2025, if we were doing an update, it seems like we'd really be focusing on, hey, they the growth can accelerate because they've got so many members and they're just starting to get the hotel inventory. And that's where they really unlock the value. That's the mm -hmm. kind of the most interesting piece of it to me. And look about it. Look at it. Like when they do come to the U.S. I mean, having the flights and the hotels is going to be is in my mind how they're going to get value for for U.S. customers because you know, as we as we discussed, you know, the 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 airlines you know are dominated by the top four. There's there's not really a a, a place for the OTAs to extract much value there. Um, you have the you have the um, price parity agreements with the hoteliers. But if you can create kind of a walled garden where you have flights plus the hotels, then who knows where the discount's coming from? And and, and like even the the price parity agreements with the hoteliers in the U.S. and the and and the airlines, like you know, have exclusions for the the dynamic packages. So. No, I I definitely hear you though. You know, I do think you mentioned Marriott loyalty. I'm with you, brother. I I think I'm lifetime silver, but uh, one more year I might hit lifetime gold. Uh, I do think U.S. It's just tough because. 85%, I think it was a mistake to let the airline market get to this concentration, but that's neither here nor there. 85% concentrated on the airlines. The hotels are quite concentrated now as well. Like you have a real reason, like, and these companies are constantly pushing you to book direct, get all the loyalty points mm -hmm. and everything. I, I could see like eDreams making people money ultimately talks, but it's tough because the the largest customers, like the most valuable customers are kind of already locked up in these loyalty programs. It's going to be tough, but here's the nice thing. If I'm right, if I'm right and you're wrong in the US, guess what? There's still all the upside we talked about in the Europe. And again, the proof is already in the pudding there. Let me talk about longer term. Uh, this, again, they're, one of the nice things about a subscription business that's just on the inflection point is it's high margins. It's super visible. And as it inflects, like I think people can be kind of shocked to the margins on the upside, generates a ton of cash. What do you think capital allocation wise? How does this play out? Well, if you go back when I first invested in this pre COVID, I think they were looking at a couple acquisitions. I think those are off the table because I think their competitors were really hurt in COVID. You know, what type of acquisitions do you think they were looking at? Just buying the number four player merging with the number three player? Or something maybe else? some local markets in Europe. There's always like a, a, a brand in, in, in that may be big in one country and you can just tack it on yep. you know, to the to the e back back end. Um, but I, I don't know. They haven't disclosed it. But I knew that they were. They did disclose that they were in talks with a couple of companies, and then maybe the regulators stopped it. And that was probably a good thing for them. Um, they had also implemented a share a share buyback program, and the, and the company uh, has a history for being extremely conservative. I mean, they have they they've given guidance 
for fiscal year 25, but that's the only guidance that, they, that they've get a, given. And you know, historically, they like to under-promise and over-deliver. Um, on the capital allocation, like, they should be buying back stock today. I mean, they they have cash on the balance sheet. They do have some debt, but um, looking at where the stock price is at and and how stable this this business is and how easy it is to to predict the growth rate of it, they should be buying back stock today. Um, I think that they want to get through calendar Q4, which is a heavy cash use period for them yep. from from a working capital perspective, and then as that working capital unwinds in Q1 next year they'll start to buy back stock i mean i hope they do it i hope they start doing it today if they don't do it today you know we're four months out so i i, I you're not going to see them doing any any acquisitions in 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 my opinion because they've proven out prime and prime is going so well their their capital is being spent on growth and that's pretty much spent in it you can see it in their capex numbers because they're allowed to to Right up, you know, right up, um, capitalize some of the some of their um, IT spend, and so that the rate of that is being driven by the, their ability to like to hire and train and get people, you know, working on, on new projects, and so you know their their capital is going to be growing going towards getting hotels to, to a point where they're ready to do a hard launch, and then after that, geographic expansion, um, and then. Beyond that, the only thing that they have to do is, you know, is pay down debt. But why would you do it at this point? They have to lock in some debt at five percent, which is cheap, and then, you know, return capital to shareholders, and you know, hopefully they do that via sherry purchases. And now, a quick word from our sponsor. Are traditional expert calls in the investment world becoming obsolete? According to Stream, they are, and you can access primary research easily and efficiently through their platform. With Stream, you'll have the right insights at your fingertips to make the best investment decisions. They offer a vast library of over 26,000 expert transcripts powered by AI search technology. Plus, they provide competitive rates on expert call services, and you can even have an experienced buy-side analyst conduct the calls for you. But that's not all. Stream also provides the ability to engage with experts one-on-one -on -one and get your calls transcribed free of charge, all for 40% less than you would pay for 20 calls in a traditional expert network model. So if you're looking to optimize your research process and increase ROI on investment research spend, Stream has the solution for you. Head over to their website at streamrg.com to learn more. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Perfect. I, I'm just looking through my notes in the uh, investor deck. I think we hit everything that I wanted to hit, at, actually. So I, I just want to ask you, you know, we talked about a lot. There's a lot to talk about. Again, this is fascinating. I'm going to be researching it a lot over the next few weeks. Um, I can see why uh, you and a bunch of smart friends are in it, but th there is a lot to think about here. Is there anything else you want to leave listeners kind of thinking about or that they should be I exploring if they continue to kind of look at eDreams or dive deeper into it? Well, I would just say like, as always, like think about the risks. You know, there there are certainly some black swan events that could affect it. I mean, if you know Russia used nuclear weapons in Ukraine, that would certainly you know put a damper on travel for a bit. For a bit. Know, once the once the missiles yeah. start flying, I kind of discount it because I guess if it was limited to Ukraine, that's fine. But once the missiles start flying, I'm like, oh, you know, probably got yeah. bigger things to worry about than the nuclear apocalypse of my portfolio. But year over year in COVID, the revenue went down eighty percent. And this company was able to survive mostly because their their cost structure at the time seventy five percent of it was variable. It's a little bit higher than that now, and so I don't think that they're. I think they can survive a lot of headwinds. I mean, right now you have a slowing slowdown in Europe. You've had massive inflation. You've had you know COVID popping up here and there, and they've and they've grown the Prime program from one million members to five, and so. I feel pretty comfortable from a from a business durability pers perspective. Like the one risk I have is that, or the one risk that, that concerns me the most is that the, if if the valuation gap between like its its current trading price and its intrinsic value it doesn't close, you know the investors you know may push for a sale, and if that happens, you know maybe they get taken out for fifteen or twenty euros, which you know would be a good outcome relative to the. 650 stock price today, but I think it would definitely leave way too much money on the table for 
for the public market investors. I, I always do laugh a little bit to myself when one of the risk factors is, hey, you know, the, if this got taken out up 150% from today's share price, I'd be furious. I'm kind of like, you know what? I'd, I'd probably take anything up 150. What do you think the prime program um, membership tops out at though? I mean, it's not going to be seven. I don't think it's going to be 14. <laughs> so. No. You know, that's another one last question on this. It is another interesting question I had. So one of the things they said is, hey, in our biggest markets, which I think is France, France is their biggest market. If I remember yeah. And, and they, they're 4.6% 4. penetrated. You mentioned that earlier, 4.6% penetrated, which is, that's enormous, right? Like <laughs> I, I remember before Netflix, uh, every subscription service in the US would top out at uh, around 30 million members, which is about 10% of the US population. People can check me. I'm directionally right on that. Like that that was before Netflix, but 10% is a lot. 4.6% for a travel program. Like there are people who don't like to travel. If I subscribe, my wife might not need to. My kids certainly don't need to. You're very retired, no longer travel parents don't need to. Like 4.6% is a lot. And look, if they can do 5% of the entire European yeah. population, like huge. But I wonder it's, if it tops out in a country, you know? Yeah, it's not 4.6% of, of the French population, it's 4.6% of like unique travelers or unique bookers. I, book I feel really dumb saying that now because I, I, they would have way more prime members if they were, I feel really stupid, but part of what I just said held, so we won't cut it out and I'm fine being stupid. So it's 4.6% of unique travelers in France? Right, yeah, like unique Wait, bookers. How many people, unique bookers on eDreams or unique bookers on overall? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I'd have to go back and check I'd on that. But they, imagine... they, they've got it, They when, they, when they've, Put together. I mean, you have to go back a couple of years. I think they dropped like what the uh, what their TAM is, and it was you know based on like unique bookers. I, I just I'd have to imagine that it's more than four point six percent of their unique bookers, just because so much of their revenue is coming from the Prime program now. But yeah, um, anything else people should be thinking about? No, I think I think that's it. This was fantastic, man. Again, I, I was calling people all day yesterday trying to get smarter because right? I'm with you, like. There is the skeptic in me that says, hey, we've seen this with TripAdvisor. No one's done this before. But then there is the proof is in the pudding. And it does seem like you're they're starting to hit the acceleration. As you said, if they're starting to hit the acceleration, like it's not stopping at 7.25 and 180 million in cash EBITDA. It, they're going to get hotels. They're going to start getting, you know, no one's ever been able to crack the how do we get experiences and stuff into a membership. But if they can start getting experiences, even if it's not fully into the membership, but it, you could imagine it, it could be absolutely enormous. And uh, yeah, you know, well, 20, 20 would not be the, the end of things. I did a little traveling this summer in in Europe and I, I booked um, my flights to and from Europe kind of directly with the, with the airlines. And I had some points, so that helped. Um, but like within Europe on the hotels, particularly I think on my, my first leg of the trip in London, I used I used the Marriott Hotel, but after that, I used eDreams and it was it was fantastic. And I was able to book it on the app. And aside from that, I was able to book hotel uh, airport transfers transportation like very easily uh, on the app, which made it you know quite convenient. So if you can throw excursions in there too, and you know, book it in app and have one place to go and have one place to kind of track your your itinerary, I think that makes it. You know, like super convenient going back to like you know the benefits of of amazon and prime like make everything convenient for the for the traveler and if the, you know, if eDreams can do that via their app then then yeah. um the one guess, location yeah. the one location is great but the other great thing about experiences is it it is the most fragmented thing and it's you know if you hit somebody with an advertisement at the right time they're very likely to book so the advertising rates and everything are off the charts and you could imagine in a prime membership they say hey you know you can book I love escape rooms. I, I'm sure you know. I love escape rooms. You can book this escape room. It's thirty dollars to book. They would pay us ten dollars uh, in commission. We'll pass all of that ten dollars onto our Prime membership, or maybe eight of the ten dollars onto our Prime membership. So you can book this escape room cheaper than you can anywhere else because of that. Like you could see the huge win-win. Hit the customer at the right time. They get an experience they love cheaper than they can get anywhere else. eDreams gets a, a little bit of margin there, and for the uh, for the escape room, they get a customer that they wouldn't have ever, they wouldn't have gotten a very competitive customer. So yeah, that, you know, again, if you start thinking about eDreams 3.0, 4.0, like you can just really yeah. start seeing the unlock there. I would say, I mean, it's, it's an interesting time. To, the, the stock is egregiously cheap. Um, the shareholder base right now is, 
you know, there's some high quality shareholders in it. There's a there's one large shareholder that needs to start to get out over time. And so as the price moves up, you may see some shares unlock, which I think would be a, a good thing and and you know increase the liquidity in the in the stock. Um, they're at the Goldman Sachs Communicopia conference today. Uh, they were invited there by the OTA analyst. Does that mean that Goldman may start covering them? Yeah, I, I don't know, but it, you know, it's a good sign. Um, they should be buying back stock shortly. You, they should do a hard push into hotels. I think once the hotels news comes out, then you'll probably see um, a new analyst day. The last analyst day they had was uh, November of 21. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of good news coming up in the, in the stock, I think. Yeah. And you can imagine an analyst day where they they push their targets further than 2025. As you said, they start giving more details on how they're cutting into hotels and how that's going to inflect mm -hmm. the business further. Uh, you can imagine all that. Cool. Well, anyway, Chet, I've got to hop, but this has been fantastic. Again, just a fantastic idea. I find it so interesting. Really appreciate you coming on for the second time. And I know there's one we've talked about offline. I'm hoping to have you on it for a third time at some point in the near future to talk that one. Too. All right. Well, I, I think I get a hat this time as a, as a second time guest. So I'll be looking for that in the mail. Don't spoil it for the other people, but you are right. Second time guests get the exclusive hat. So All right. well, talk to you soon, Chad. Have a good day. A quick disclaimer, nothing on this podcast should be considered investment advice. Guests or the hosts may have positions in any of the stocks mentioned during this podcast. Please do your own work and consult a financial advisor. Thanks.